Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, so I, I, I wanted to share something with you first. And, um, and then after that, uh, we can do a little Q&A or just whatever, whatever we want to talk about at that point. We'll do that. Um, so the theme today is around entrepreneurship and around um, how to create a better world, a more beautiful world, specifically. So I wanted to try to solve this uh, and share, share, um, share a perspective I have um, within this realm to see what you think about it, just for fun. So I hope you like dry, dry humor. The disclaimer here is that this is, um, this is simply a point of view that's mine. Um, and um, I'm here to share it with you, and I hope you find your own point of view. And uh, if you want to take this one, you take anything you want from it for whatever, and, and value it however you'd like. So um, let's start here. Um, I like this as a starting point. It's an interesting perspective. Uh, it's a concept that, is, um, that has infinite complexity, but also profound simplicity. So um, let's just start from that, just for our minds. And then let's move into this perspective, um, which is, for the sake of analysis, let's, let's pretend that, uh, that we're separate from one another and separate from our environment, just, just to think about it in that way. And consider that the universe, uh, from this perspective, is, is one in which um, we're experiencing a series of events um, that happen to us. Uh, just think about that as a framework for how we look at things as human beings. So within that lens, um, humanity is, um, is somewhat like a ship that's left a port and it's sailing off out, out, into, uh, out into the future. And uh, I, I brought up a point about this yesterday because it just came to mind yesterday. So I, I built the, the talk about, uh, about this uh, metaphor, this metaphor of the ship and humanity. So um, the question is, you know, where is it heading and how does it go there? How does it work? Um, and where do, we, where, do we, um, where do we end up? Um, so we're on this journey, and we're, we're facing seemingly insurmountable challenges, like storms, that seem to be happening to us, right? Um, and if it's not storms, it's creatures from the abyss that come up and, and, uh, and come after us. Again, events that occur that, uh, that influence the path of our ship. Uh, and even if we get there, this is, this is the part that you guys are not going to like me when I say this, but even when we, when we get there, we get to paradise, we only get to be there for about one to four billion years before the sun implodes. So anyway, <laughs> that's the framework. Just, just start from that perspective of things happening to us and think about it for a second. So where do we, where do we start? Where do we, where do we get back to square one? And I think... Um, What's interesting about this is that um, we always come back to square one and start over again. It's just part of what we do. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to try this. We're going to try to go to Mars. And we're going to try to go on to other places and do other things. Because that's what we do. Um, so when I step back and look at it, it's a, it's a challenging choice. And... <laughs> And I think that a lot of us, a lot of people in general, feel a sense of shame that they have to make this choice, no matter what choice they make, or two choices they make, they had to give up something else. And that's an awful hard thing to deal with. Um, so sometimes, it feels as though our body is a cage for our ego. And this is, if you can't see it, it's a picture of a brain that's uh, cutting a piece of rope, dropping a cage on, on the body while it's asleep. And I think, um, you know, the question I want to ask is, is this okay? This is where I'm tying into um, to some of the stuff that's across the way out here. What's interesting about this to me is that um, we have a choice, and the choice is our viewpoint. We can look at it as a, a large pile of poop, if we want. Um, and we can also look at it in this way and admire it for what it is and admire its beauty to some extent. And in that case, maybe we do compostable toilets and we use it for some other purpose. But that's just an example. So this raises the question of why do entrepreneurs exist? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, so I hope you guys do. Uh, what's interesting to me is just the to observe that they do exist, 
there's something that we can observe and they happen. So entrepreneurs happen. So here's my, my fundamental statement is that I believe entrepreneurs are inspired by the poo and are compelled to act. That's what I can observe. So. Are you a new father or something? Yeah. <laughs> so. Actually, baby's poo doesn't smell, and it's, it's, it's crazy. Not until they get older. Um, but don't tell me that, because my baby's only three months old, so I don't, I'm not aware of that yet. I'm not aware of that yet. So it doesn't exist. So we're endlessly persistent entrepreneurs, and what I love about this audience is that everyone in here is, is, is part of this group, and it's, it's really exciting to be around so many of them. We're endlessly persistent. We're endlessly enterprising. And I get back to this question, you know, why, why do they exist? Um, and I don't have a framework for understanding this other than something that I picked up on a book, uh, in a book that I read a while back um, from Arnold Toynbee, and I mentioned it to you yesterday, um, which is the concept of, of the creative minority, which is this small percentage of the population. And there's this great historian who studied this in the 1800s and wrote a a very, very long book about um, the rise and fall of civilizations and the role that these, these creative groups play. And he sort of lumps together entrepreneurs, activists, artists, leaders, academics, philosophers, so you guys basically, into this group that ends up um, actually driving the future in an interesting way. Um, so I just want to leave you with a couple of interesting quotes from him around this. I like that one. And here's another one. An interesting thought here is around um, the suppression of the, um, of the creative minority actually is, is an indicator of a dark age. And I think that we're in a, a pretty um, awesome time right now because I think this group is growing and I think it's connecting more than ever. So. I'll tie it all together with this one, which is part of what Evan was talking about earlier. Um, this concept of indiv indiv individualism and the importance of that for, as a, a fuel for change. Um, and it's fuel for change, I think, because it actually powers the ego. And the ego is what does the changing. Um, so the call to action is to find your own, find your own truths, however you, you decide to find them create your momentum, and use that to steer the ship. And don't apologize for it. So that's it. So we have some time for questions, which are a lot more fun than this. So. That's pretty fun. Good. That was a lot of fun. Reflections. Um, having known you, Adam, for, for a number of years, I know that you're one of the most sophisticated thinkers at some of the edges of technology right now in terms of what's possible, um, especially as it relates to hardware and software, kind of the intersection and various types of platforms and protocols that, that can emerge there. And I'm just curious if you can maybe, you know, any reflections and kind of um, trends you're seeing in Silicon Valley that could, might inspire the New Zealand entrepreneurial ecosystem with uh, things to be out uh, on the new frontiers of? Yeah. Well, I think that the tools for innovation and creativity are, um, are more accessible than ever. And, and, it's, and it's trending uh, exponentially in that direction. So, um, and that makes, um, I think place matters less. People matter more um, because people can do a lot more with the tools at hand. So I think that that's, that's, um, that's a sign that you know, people in New Zealand are going to be relatively better off. Um, and if the culture fosters more of that kind of collaboration around innovation, then they have the tools at hand to go out and do interesting things with those tools. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of in a, my career has been focused on um, sort of smart machine technology. Um, I worked in robotics, worked in um, sensor technology, both for 
industrial applications and quasi-military applications and also for, um, for home applications. So I think that uh, I think the sky's the limit in terms of what we could try. I don't know how it's going to play out. If you know, let me know. But, but I think that uh, in New Zealand, I think they have a huge opportunity to take advantage of this um, proliferation of technology that's at their hands now. It's available. And this is not just New Zealand, but anybody, actually. Like, I grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and so, you know, four generations back, I would have been a farmer. And uh, my grandfather was a farmer before that. Before that, you know, 100 generations before, I would have been a farmer. And then now I'm here, which is strange. And, and so, yeah, I think, I think for anyone who's on the fringes of, fringes of civilization, and, it, you know, this is a faraway place, but it's, the, how fast is the Internet connection here? It's, you know, it's just as fast as anywhere else. It's, it's right on the main pipeline right now for information flow. So that is, uh, that's, it's, a, it's a really unique time in history. Yeah. yeah and I, I think what really excites me is that intersection with technology and um, how we're able to export ourselves to a small little country on the edge of the earth. And um, if you combine those things with a quote that was coming to mind from Margaret Mead, which I think she said, never doubt that a group of, um, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world indeed it's the oh, yeah. only thing that ever has um yeah. oh totally that that's the interesting thing it's that uh, yeah a very very small group of people actually create the future they create the movements that create the future and um so they just keep just keep doing it why not and encourage others to do it and take a breather when you when, you, when you're down too deep and you're you're just pushing away through that ego is running you just take a, take a take a moment to take space or create space and breathe because um, you'll actually be able to go further and that's what creates the change. Yeah. Further reflections here. I'm not sure I have a question here, but I'm wondering if you could riff on Burning Man a little bit and its role and something for Kiwis to consider in being players in, in the space of creating the future. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know a lot about Burning Man. I mean, I've been there twice, but... Um, it certainly seems like a, a place where people connect, get, get, they get together, and they, um, they have that breather. That's the purpose, I think. I, at least that's the purpose for me when I've gone, is just to have that breather, to step back, and, uh, and kind of reconsider where, where everything's at right now, and then get back to what I'm doing afterwards. And I think that's, that's part of the sort of space, creating space for people, I think. Getting like space and breathing and allowing that time. So a question here from Tyrone. Just uh, wanted to leverage a little bit of your experience in robotics and maybe have you speak a little bit about um, how you see the trend towards robotics versus human labor, the future, how that might work out. Do you really want to know? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, my take on all this, and this is just, a, this is just a, what comes to mind is, we're, we're heading down this path of um, advancing technology, and it started a long time ago. And um, it's going to continue for quite a while. Uh, and it's interesting that, um, you know, I think we're just part of the way there, and, and it's, it, it's going to go a lot further before, um, before we see how deep we are in the technology. And, um, and then I think that it's going to be something that we, we manage with social mechanisms, much like we to deal with sociopathic killers and that kind of thing. We're going to deal with runaway AIs, and we're going to have a lot of interesting problems that pop up that we have to deal with as part of that. Um, but it's hard to predict exactly. Uh, it's just a general momentum, it's, and it's going to continue for a long period of time. Yeah. Other question here? Hey, Adam. Yeah. What, um, you have experience both kind of on the software and the hardware side. You seem to, I don't know, be one of those rare people that gets the integration. What's technology going to be able to do in the next three to five years that most of us don't realize that it's going to be able to do? Uh, three to five years? I mean, I, I think I, I'm probably a little more pessimistic than a lot of people about the timelines because I think they're hard to predict. But um, what it's able to do uh, and, and, how it's, and, and how far it's employed, I think, are two different things. Um, there are a lot of things out there that that are able to be done, like autonomous cars and such, right? But are they going to be employed or deployed or employed in, in, in use in, say, three to five years? That's hard to say. Um, but able to do, that's a tough question. I guess, you know, I, I don't know, because I, I, I'm so focused on the space that I'm in that I don't know. Um, but 
in the area that I'm working right now, in three to five years, we'll be able to model out a lot of, um, a lot of energy consumption in the home, understand exactly what's, what's driving that, uh, tie that to behavior, and then influence people's behaviors around energy consumption. That's one thing we're working on really effectively. We'll, so we'll build tools to not only directly automate uh, heating and cooling in the home and other things like that, other device use and uh, energy use, but actually um, build that into frameworks for encouraging people to change behavior that has a, an impact. And it's an interesting uh, fusion of impact where it's, you know, on the, for example, on the energy side, it's, it's uh, reducing their energy consumption, but it's widening margins for the energy provider, right? So it's, there's a business motive there. Um, that's, that's, that's one area we're working on. Uh, the other is around uh, safety. Uh, and security and other things like that, just knowing, knowing about things. That, 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 that will affect uh, the way that insurance is, 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 um, is done as well and calculated. But it, there's a lag, I think. So what we can do now is we can, we can, there's a, we can do a lot with satellite imaging and with, with sensors, in the, very simple sensors in the home that are very inexpensive. We could prevent house fires. We could present, prevent security um, break-ins and that kind of thing or know exactly what's happening. But then you have this other thing, which is privacy. And that's going to be another area that uh, we have to deal with. Yeah, it's gonna deciding what what where, what our boundaries are, and yeah, that's one of the that's one of the parts of it that keeps keeps me up at night actually. Hmm. Um, hey Adam, just uh, over here. Oh, <laughs> uh, just riffing off the last two questions, just a bit of a fun question to throw at you. Um, it seems that um, well, there was a school of thought, I guess, that uh, technology is essentially evolving. Um, and with your experience uh, in robotics and the hardware, software side of things, um, do you see technology as undergoing its own sort of evolution, its own sort of natural evolution? Um, and if so, do you see it being something that is able to be controlled, or do you see that, um, yeah, I'll hand that. Well, here's my takeaway of this. Um, I think that uh, we are convinced that we can control everything, and so we're going to keep building it. And uh, I think that a lot of a lot of like AI is going to end up being a simplification of what we already do, um, and it, and it's so in some ways it's maybe less advanced than us, um, but that doesn't necessarily matter for survival purposes. I guess you, if you separate um, consciousness and you separate you separate that from survival, those are two separate things. Do you, do you do you see it being able to enhance the human experience by us being able to sort of push our sensory organs to have a wider sort of like the the merging of robotics with the uh. sort of it's a tough, it's a, it depends on what you think enhancing is. And so that's a hard one to answer, but uh, it will certainly, it will, it'll, it'll take a form of its own over time mm -hmm. and we'll become less, less conscious uh, eventually. And it, it may out survive us if, if we don't um, keep, our, keep our planet healthy um, or if we can't sustain human life in space, then the technology will out survive us, which is bizarre. So it'll be like a devolved version of us. Cool, thanks. Final reflection. So, Adam, we just had a chance to speak outside, but I wanted to ask you something because this kind of comes off of Scott's presentation. So, your relationship with investors, who have you chosen and why did you choose them? That's a good question. Um, well, we work with Founders Fund. Um, where is Scott, by the way? Is he? Oh, he's over there where I was. Um, so. In our first business, uh, we worked with Founders Fund and then a lot of other um, entrepreneurs, a lot of friends. Um, and how do, how do we go about doing that? I think it's personal connections. That's a big part of it. Um, uh, we bootstrapped the first company. Uh, my brother and I bootstrapped it in a garage, got it going, funded, led all the rounds, actually. Um, and then, uh, you know, my brother knew Peter pretty well, so Peter came into that round. Um, and then we just, a lot of friends came in as well. And then Founders Fund came in, too. So it was kind of a progression over time. But... Uh, the way I like to approach is I like I like to, I like to focus on the, the the mission and the vision first, and use that as a filter for anybody who wants to get involved. And um, that doesn't always work. Over time, it changes and things th things change and you, the vision will bend and twist and turn. Uh, but the right investors will stay with that over time. And I think that's 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 a big filtering mechanism for me personally. But um, uh, I think for for other people in the management team that I work with, they may have other filters that they personally employ around pricing or other relationships that they've got. But I don't know. I like Peter a lot, and I like Founderson a lot. Um, in the second business, we worked with um, two other VC firms. Um, and I don't know them quite as well. Um, so we're getting to know each other over the process of working together. I've been working together about two years. 
but it takes a long time. You know, with the first business we started it in 2007, and then I think Founders Fund came in in 2009 or 10, I think. So, so we've been working together for about five, six years. So it takes it takes years to develop those relationships. Yeah. Cool, Adam. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. It was awesome. Thank you.